Maybe we could kind of kind of start coming together and uh, getting ready. How many of you like this time of year? I love it. I love it. Uh, you know. You know why? Is because I, I'm going to tell you about myself. Okay, I like Oregon. I've I've been I've been around the world. And I like Oregon the best. You know why I like Oregon the best? Is we actually have four different seasons here that I like. Because you know what? By the time summer's over, I'm ready for summer to be over. Okay? And I'm ready to get on to something else, right? And, and Oregon, you have it. You know, I lived in California when I was in the military for a long time. And you had one season. I remember that on, in December, we were on the beach. It was hot, okay? And so I, 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 did, I always missed, where, wherever I was, I was always missed having the seasons change. Now, I have been places where when the seasons changed, it was extreme. How many of you have lived in those places? Whoa, and that was over the top for me. I like Oregon because... It's not so over the top most of the time, you know. You're, you're, it's it's fairly mild as we do that. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Okay, you guys are sounding good, sounding good. You know what? Let's go over once more, one more time. I'm going to tell you something. I'm excited today. I'm really excited today. Because if we look over over here and just keep looking over the audience, we can see. What place is back? <laughs> Steve is back with us. And you know what? Here's the deal. Is I was so excited to hear him teach today. He is strong. He is strong. And I was so proud of him and so excited about hearing him speak again that it just amazed me. And so, yeah, we love you. <laughs> And so I'm so excited to have him back because, you know what, he's part of our family, and when, he, when he's not around, you know, and doing what we normally see him do, I kind of get, I kind of miss him. You know, we get to missing him, and so it's good to have him back. You know, we still need to love on him. Of course, we need to love on each other all the time, right? Amen. Isn't that what we're here for? We're here to praise and worship Yahweh and to build each other up and to love on one another. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to give you a heads up right now. I'm going to be talking about birth pains today. Okay? And it's a subject that I don't know much about. In fact, I've never been able to figure out why women, if it was up to a man, every family would have one. Amen? I've never understood that whole thing. But we're going to discuss it today as we go through. So when I say discuss it, that doesn't mean me. Remember, I just got through telling you I'm not the expert on this subject. Okay, so I need you guys to gear up and start mentally gearing up now because I need help in that area and I'm going to rely on you guys, no, you women, to help me understand these things and help us all understand these things. Okay, so gear up now, get ready for that now. What did I say? No, that was only part of you, man. What did I say? <laughs> Get the coffee in here. <laughs> and it's an emergency. Bring it quick. It's good to have you today. How about if we stand up and do the Shema? Shema is Yahweh Eloheinu Yahweh Echad Baruch Shem Kevod 
Lord Malahuto Leo Lombayan. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one. Blessed is the name of his esteemed kingdom for all eternity. You may be seated, and how about if we have some announcements? Ah, the green light. There wasn't a green light on the other one. Okay. Good morning. I am so glad you're here this morning. I love this time of the year also. You know why? The wind blows and brings in fresh air, takes out the old air. You can feel winter is on its own and it's on its way. The earth, our part of the earth is beginning to get prepared for winter time, a time of rest, so the earth can recharge itself. Leaves are blowing in the air. You know what I like about that the best? How many of you enjoy raking leaves? Am I it? Here's the plan. If you live in a cul-de-sac and you have a lot of people and neighbors have leaves, if you time it just right, the wind will blow all the leaves off of your property onto your neighbor's property. And they're out there raking whose leaves? Your leaves. It's a great time of the year. The other thing is I've noticed too is I love that wind blowing. Now, how many of you stood in front of the mirror and added extra hairspray this morning in preparation for the wind? Yeah, right. Uh, how many of you used a half a can, maybe? Some of you made a little bit of butch wax. And some of you with hats on, I realize, we don't even know if you combed your hair or not. It's not even necessary because what's underneath there may be held private to you and your mirror. So the, only, the idea is, is that we've come out all coiffed, come ready to come together to assemble one. And whether your hair is must or some of those of us that don't have much hair to get must, we are still prepared to come to the Heavenly Father's place to have worship and celebration one with another. By the way, my wife is sick today. and She wanted me to make sure and tell everybody hi. I said, that's what you want me to say? She says, yes. So I've been practicing all the way over here. So here goes. Hi. <laughs> I did my part. She said hi, but she's got a different sounding voice this morning, and it's very, very unique. So I doubt if she can hit any high notes. So it's a wonderful time of the year. We're getting pre prepared for, how many of you celebrate Hanukkah? Even though it's not a scriptural traditional celebration. Some of us do, in fact, kind of celebrate it. Even if you don't, though, it's an amazing story as we prepare for that time of the year, the great and wonderful Hanukkah. And if those of you who are not familiar with it, I would uh, encourage you to read about the amazing things that went on during the time of the Maccabees. It is absolutely amazing. Anyway, to get to actual announcements, it's going to be kind of boring today. I went to my fellow assemblage. Assemblage. Is that a new word I just made up? It isn't. Okay. Assemblage persons. And I asked them if they had any announcements, and there's not very many of them, but some of them are very key. We need some more help in the nursery. We are desperation. But there are some job qualifications. You must be able to change a diaper. How many of you have had experience? How many of you would like to be trained in that experience? <laughs> Terry has taken on that new project and he's gonna be holding a class and folding diapers. See with him if you wanna know how to do that. <laughs> Those of you who depend upon store-bought, you won't need that. I love it when he turns about 16 shades of red over there, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> the clothes closet still needs help. Remember our conversation last time? If you go in there try on clothes, please be sure and fold them the way your wife would and not the way guys do. By the way, I had a chuckle to myself. I got a top on my shoulder at uh, the last own egg, and uh, Fred says, Adele, there's a note left for you in the clothes closet. So I go in there, and there's, there's three nicely rolled shirts. And I said, Dale, I had to do this to you. So we don't need any more notes. Fold them the way women would, and I think everything will be fine. We also need some help with the sounds of more volunteers. Wave at us. Uh, we, we only have a couple job descriptions. You have to be able to read. 
you have to be able to hear and there will be a test. They didn't say anything about passing it. They're just going to be a test. So whether you pass, fail, doesn't make any difference. So they need some help in the uh, sound booth. Uh, we also <laughs> need some help and with ideas for activities for 10 and 15 year olds, years old. No, we don't need help. You're good. D Dorothy, you're telling me that you're all set with 10 and 15 year olds? The most dangerous time frame of children known to mankind? They're not a problem. Well, I was going to rec <laughs> I was going to recommend those of you who want to volunteer, apparently she doesn't need any volunteers. There's a sale on flak jackets down at the store that means body armor. I don't know about you that the, the 10 and 15 year olds that I've ever known in some of the tutoring center that I have, have been a little bit of a challenge. I've never met such young people who know so much and seem to know where to go and what they're doing and need to feel the, the need to instruct us. So I know that you may need a flak jacket. Maybe we need to put that on our budget for next time, Dorothy, that, to protect you. You don't. There will be a counseling session for Dorothy later on. She continues to. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see, anything else? Uh, please remember, uh, if you do have any dishes in the kitchen area, to pick them up because they're beginning to accumulate again. And if you don't pick them up, of course, we're gonna dispose of them, whether we sell them, give them away, or in some fashion. So if you end up having seven cups instead of eight, their eighth cup may be in the kitchen. Yes, yeah, Steve. I, I brought a box of uh, um, containers that you, you all have given um, food to me over the months. And I put it in where the refrigerators are in that little room on the side. And, and also there's some other things in there um, that you guys have loaned me. And so I brought them all and they're all in there. So if you guys know who you are that gave to me, stuff to me, because I won't remember, um, they're all in that, a box in a little table in that little room over there where the freezer and refrigerator are. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Please pick those up. Um, of course, there might be some rent charge if you don't later on. Let's, uh, let's all stand and read the scriptures this morning. I enjoy reading the scriptures. The scriptures reveal so much about our Heavenly Father, His love for us, and what we should have is our respect for Him. And every time I get an opportunity to read His scriptures, to let Him feed his spirit in my heart and make it be part of my DNA, I take advantage of that. How many of you like to do that? How many of you take an opportunity to bathe your hearts and your souls every day with a word from the Heavenly Father? It is amazing. Does it change your life? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to read from Psalms 137. And the title of this psalm happens to be in my manuscript. Excuse me, 138, A Thankful Heart. Psalms 138, A Thankful Heart. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praise before the heavenly beings. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your constant love and truth. You have exalted your name and your promise above everything else. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased a strength within me. All the kings on earth will give you thanks, Yahweh, when they hear what you have promised. They will sing of Yahweh's ways, for Yahweh's glory is great. Though Yahweh is exalted, he takes note of the humble, but he knows the haughty from a distance. If I walk into the thick of danger, you will preserve my life. From the anger of my enemies, you will extend your hand. Your right hand will save me. Yahweh will fulfill his purposes for me. Yahweh, your love is eternal. Do not abandon the work of your hands. And that we can take to the bank. Isn't that amazing? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word that we can apply to our heart. And it becomes part of our DNA that as we walk through this life and we touch the lives of other Heavenly Father, let part of that rub off on them. Let us, our lives be a seed of planting to the furtherance of your kingdom. Let us help us to make your name renowned. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this Shabbat that we can worship and serve you. Thank you for the changing of the weather, the changing of the earth as we prepare for another season. Thank you for all that you do, your provision for us. Yahushua's mighty name we prayed and we all said, 
Amen. Amen. Let's see, are we going to praise the children? Sounds like a good idea. Let's have some men come forward, and we're going to praise our children. When I say praise, you know, we want to help uplift them, but we also want to bless them, too. And if you would, please put your hands forward towards them, please. give Yahweh a hand, would you please? Amen. And let's remain standing as we prepare our hearts to worship.
together we sing. El 
what can I do? But offer this heart, Yahweh, completely to you.
We're at a, the part of our service where we have the opportunity to pray for one another. And I'm going to ask you to pray for one another, but I'm going to ask you if you want to be anointed by the elders and prayed for, please come forward at this time and, and we'll pray for you. While you're in the pews, uh, please pray for each other. If you feel led to pray for someone, go to that person and pray for them.
surgery schedule for hopefully December 9th. They've changed it three times already. So what's wrong with you? Yeah, I do have cancer. Oh, you have cancer? I do have cancer. And, you know, I've sat on it for quite a while. I was trying to act in faith and stuff, and I was believing for healing. But um, it's, it's kind of gotten far along, so... Father, I just thank you for my brother, and I, I thank you that um,
Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 16. That's John chapter 16. And we'll start in verse 16 and, and go uh, to, to John chapter uh, uh, 16 through, um, I think it's 24. Yes. Now remember, this is a time where Yeshua is with his disciples. It's a time just before um, he's arrested. And, and, of course, the next day would be crucified. And he's having, we've talked about this before, he's having this intimate conversation with his, his disciples. You know, when you, when you think about this, what, what would it have been like to be with Yeshua that last night? To understand, hear what he was saying, and understand it, and yet they didn't really know and understand what was about to take place. He says some things, Yeshua does, to his, to his disciples that are kind of mind-boggling when you think about it. And there, there are things that he says, you know what, you're going to understand this night in future times. I'm going to make these known to you. But this is one of those, those things that he says that, that baffle him, and I would like to read it, starting in John 16 and verse 16. It says, a little while, and you will no longer see me. Again, a little while, and you will see me. Therefore, some of his disciples said to one another, what is this he tells us? A little while, and you'll, you will not see me again, uh, me. and again, a little while, and you will see me, because I am going to the Father. They said, what is this that he is saying? A little while. We don't know what he's, what he's talking about. Yeshua knew they wanted to, to question him, so he said to them, are you asking one another about what I said? A little while? And you will not see me again in a little while. You will, you will see me. I assure you, you will weep and wail, but the world will rejoice. You will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. When a woman is, is in labor, she has pain because of her time has come. But when... when when he has come, the, the, she has given birth, she no longer will, re, will remember the suffering because of joy that a person has been born into the world. So you also have sorrow now. But I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will rob you of your joy. In that day, you will not ask me anything. I... I assure you, anything you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked not for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time that you've given us today. I ask that you just open the eyes of our hearts, cause us to understand exactly how this applies to us and what it means to us. In the name of Yeshua, amen. It's like I told you at the beginning of the service, I am not an expert on what um, is said here. Can we get the microphone now? I'm not an expert on this child, this labor pain stuff, okay? I do know some things about it. I know that in my family, having labor pains brought about some kind of control over behavior of children. Okay, because here's what I heard. Son, I spent 30 some hours in labor and you do this to me? 
Now, I notice that if it was that bad, she had a second one, my brother. Okay, so I know that that wasn't really what it was about, but I also noticed, in fact, just recently, we've had two uh, mothers that gave birth that were very hard births. One of them is, uh, is Lynn, Lena, Craig and Lena Pauley. Their daughter gave birth, and the daughter was, the, was in labor for 36 hours. And it, ca- it came to a point where she, the, 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 the child had entered the birth canal and was in a position that it was dangerous. And it wasn't moving, the baby wasn't progressing through the, the birth canal. And it, they had talked about a C-section, but they explained to them that if they did a C-section, it would put the mother at risk of death. And they said that the other thing that they could do was be to suck the baby out. And it said it puts the baby at risk to do that. So they're in this dilemma. So they decided to go ahead and and suck this out, suck this baby out. And the baby came out and everything was okay. Okay, and except for the mother says, man, I'm just really tired and I'm pretty sore. I'm thinking, yeah, <laughs> you know, all that time, right? The other one was just recently, was, I found out about it last night, actually, and it was Dee's great-grandchild. And in both of these situations, the mother had had high blood pressure, and so it put the mother at risk. But in Dee's case, they, they went ahead and, uh, and delivered the baby. It was three... Three, 12, three pounds of 12 ounces when the baby's on the right. The baby's fine. And the mother is. Both of them are. But, you know, when you, when you look at this kind of thing, I'm going to tell you how men are, because I know. I am one. Okay, when I feel pain, there's some things I stay away from. I try to figure out what caused that pain. And I try to steer clear from that, right? Because I don't want that happening again. And I've got limps and so forth to prove that, and scars to prove that I didn't like it and I wasn't going to do that again. You know what I mean? But mothers go through all this pain. And I've actually, my wife, my wife said that she wanted two children. She didn't want one. So she made a decision that she was going to have two children even after the pain of the first one. I've been in the delivery room and I've watched what takes place. Your wife no longer it seems to be your wife. Something happens. And yet, afterwards, they're already almost planning the next one. And I'm thinking, there's something that I'm not connecting with here, okay? Because like I mentioned earlier, if it was up to the man to have babies we'd have one per family. Amen? You men. Is that right? Don't, you don't have to be macho here. I mean, it's like, well, I don't know. I mean, I could do that. No. It's not like that at all. If it was a guy, after he got out of the hospital, he'd say, I'm not doing it again. Period. Okay? I know they're cute. <laughs> so what I want to do, well, sometimes they're cute, yeah. <laughs> sometimes you question it, you know. <laughs> but what I want to do is I want to get from you, some of you mothers, why that you seem to forget what took place in the labor room. Who wants to be the first to speak up? It's not that we forget, it's just that we don't care. We're holding this beautiful thing that came from us, so we just don't care anymore. It was well worth it. It's no point dwelling on something you can't change. (laughs) 
and the pain is gone. So you have this joy in your arms. Makes, makes it all better. There's a joy that follows when you first see that child. And the pain is the reward for going through it. It's the seeing the child and having the joy and being able to watch that child grow. I had a real little one that looked like an African baby, but I still loved it because it was the joy of being able to give another son to my husband. It's the three-letter word, joy. The pain is gone, and you can move on. Who else? Right back here. Yeah. It's also the love for your spouse and being intimate, trusting the Father that he'll bring you through another one. I'd agree with everything that's been said. Uh, the pain comes to an end, and there is incredible joy, and they are treasures, and uh, yeah, they're beautiful. And it's also amazing to watch the process as how Yahweh has created our bodies to do such an amazing task. I knew this would work out well, because actually what you said was what Scripture said. You know, it comes down to this, is the joy of Him is what makes the labor pains seem to go away. They go through this time, and He's telling them of what's going on. They're going through this time. He tells them, you're gonna go through this time of suffering because I'm not here. Now think about this. They knew and actually had even proclaimed who he was. That he was the Messiah. And they, they expected him to overthrow Rome and sit on the, on the throne and restore Israel to its rightful place. Now think about this. <clears throat> if your love for Israel was really high, and the only thing that you're looking for is to get out from under the bondage and have Israel be like, the, have the glory that Israel used to have. How excited would you be? You'd be over the top, right? Because now we would have our king back and our king would re totally restore Israel and Israel would take its rightful place over all the world. Is, isn't that what the promise was? But now he's saying, I'm going to go away in, for a little while. Now that changes things. How can you have your Messiah that's going to rule over all of the earth going away? Now you understand what this means. This means that if he goes away, that means that the authority of, of Israel under his reign would also go away. It means that, that these, these people would be in ridicule for thinking that he was the Messiah, and that's exactly what the people around him, or around them, said, were saying. And he says that, he says, the, the, the world's gonna rejoice, but you're gonna suffer. You're gonna go through this suffering time you need to know, though, that, it, that it's like this birth pains that, that you go through the suffering, but I'm going to return, and when I return for a little while, in a little while, 
you'll have great joy. Because, because why? Because your son, the son of Yahweh, has been born. And your joy will be great and he'll remove the memories or the, the concerns about your pain. Now the question comes up, and it, it, it made me think, how much do I really love him? That I'm willing to go through the suffering to have him appear again. That I, I'm so focused on the joy that he brings that the pain is only temporary and a minor thing. You know, I gotta tell you something. You've heard me talk about before, you've heard me talk about my grandson. My grandson can almost get away with anything with my wife. Sometimes if Papa didn't step in, he'd have her wrapped around his little finger. Okay? And you know why she's so, the way she is over him? is because her son and daughter-in-law, our daughter-in-law, gave birth to that child. And there's joy. And I can see the joy because I love that little kid amazingly. And if I'm not careful, he'll do that to me too. Grandma has to hold me back because Everything, every time he says, I want something, she doesn't want to leave me alone because she knows he's going to get it. <laughs> but there's so much joy. Now, I didn't go through the pain, but let me tell you about his mother. His mother, our daughter-in-law, her, his, her name is Michelle, adores him and adores both of those kids. And acts like there wasn't even a labor room. Because she's so in love with him. You could see it almost immediately when they handed the Braylon to her. You could see it almost immediately that, that there was almost no concern over what the pain was. Now to me, he looked like kind of a prune <laughs> but I know that when I we started babysitting him two weeks after he was born and I used to sit in my easy chair and lay him on my chest and he would sleep and what a joy that was for me what I'm talking about is being in love with Yeshua so much that that's what we want. I'm talking about that, that his presence, his breath, his every word is what we hang on. That when he enters the room, it just fills us with joy to overflowing. When we get the opportunity to worship him, it gives us great joy to, to bring our, our offering of worship to him. That's what he's talking about here. And I thought, I thought there's no better people to understand that joy than, than the mothers because they understand the pain that they went through but the joy that, that came from there. And it's exactly what he says. And I begin to ask myself, do you have that joy in him? Are there, are, are there other things that bring you greater joy? And why? And we talked about it a little bit today when we, when we, when we talked about the idea of 
our identity. Who do we really believe that we are? You see, Isaac is a picture of Yeshua. And Isaac, listen to me, Isaac, they, she gave birth to Isaac, and she was barren before that. She couldn't have a child. And yet Yahweh, here's the thing, is that Yahweh brought a child into their lives, not by them trying to do something, but by the promise that he'd given. Who are we? We say that, that we're, we're followers of Yeshua. We say that we're, we're part of the way, which is what they were called back then. What does it mean to be part of that group? You see, we say, and how many of you have, even in the Sunday church, taught, heard people say that we're de dependents of Abraham? That we're part of, of the, the seed of Abraham? I heard it all the time. My question is, how can we be part of the seed of Abraham, Abraham if we never enter into the covenant that was promised through Abraham to Isaac? You see, that ought to bring us great joy. Because by all rights, I didn't deserve any of that. I didn't deserve a co that covenant. You know what we talked about today? How that, that covenant was part of the last. In other words, Abraham was given the covenant, but it was made clear to him that the covenant would be for his offspring, Isaac. So when Isaac was born, and especially when we see Isaac getting married, we begin to, the, the seed, the last part of the covenant coming into place. Not that we're completely done with it, but that it's in place. We, this is the, when he came into that covenant, it began to last, and we continue into last until everything is brought under the control of Messiah, put under his foot. You can't, have, you can't be a part of the seed of, of, the, of Abraham and the covenant and be a part of that. You know what I mean? There was another one that was done by the flesh. Another child, remember, she, he, yeah, his, Sarah had given her handmaiden to Abraham. Now, if you're not part of the covenant, guess what part you are? the part of the flesh. Not part of the covenant. It's huge on identity. This is who we are. This is the one, if you, if you will, this is the one that ratified the covenant. This is the one that the covenant was promised to. Yeshua Messiah. And those that come in through him were the ones that would receive the covenant. And you know what he's saying to us? He's saying for a little while, I'm going to go away. But in a little while, I will return and I will, I will establish the covenant here on earth. Right now, for a little while, you'll suffer. Right now, for a little while, you're gonna feel the birth pains. You know what, and that's the part that I wanted to get to, is that we ought to be rejoicing that we're feeling the birth pains because we know if we feel the birth pains that we're part of the covenant that's coming into place. Listen to me, look at the world. Those that are not part of the covenant think that the world is okay and it's headed the way it should be. 
And they're persecuting those that are part of the covenant. We may be suffering, but we don't need to be joyless. In fact, we ought to have great joy because we know that we're within the part of the covenant where he's re- we're going to return and establish his covenant here on earth and with his people. We know that that part of him establishing it here on earth and among his people involves a new earth, a new creation, even in us. You know, I'm going to tell you something. That understanding excites me. Because in the time frame that I'm in now, you know what? I know that we're in this part of the birth pains that when he returns, we'll forget. Because great joy will be here. Amen? Can you understand that? It isn't about, oh, I've got to suffer. I have this big burden on my back. It's about we're in a place where it's about to come forth. Where our Messiah is about to return and about to establish his kingdom. It's where we can rejoice because the sun has been is here. The sun is on the scene. Can you rejoice in that? Does that change the perspective of it? Because that's what he's trying to get them to understand. Now, it, he, as, as he's giving prophecy, it had to come place in their time. Right? For him, otherwise, what do you do with a, with a prophet that, that gives false prophecy? So what happened was, is that he was crucified. And he was gone for a little while. And then he rose. And he was here again, and they could rejoice. It's the same thing for us. Don't be quiet. Dance. Right? Because we're part of this. We're part of this understanding. We're part of this this whole idea. And that's what he's saying to them right there. Or... What we could do is get lost, so lost up in the persecution and suffering that we fail to see the son being born. It's a choice. Every day, every hour. You know, I, I did the funeral for... Raquel had that privilege and I I spoke on um, on Sarah's funeral with Abraham and and how that that uh, he would not take a covenant with the enemy there was a the group that he actually was negotiating for um, this cave was, was, was called the sons of Heth. Heth means terror. And they were trying to give him this cave, which would mean that he would have to make a covenant with terror. And Abraham would not hear of it. Abraham says, I will buy that for the price that it costs. I will pay the full price. And he did. And, and you know what? That set the way for the covenant to take place in that land. For Israel. That set the place for Israel to come into the land of Canaan. 
Later on, we find Jacob in Egypt, and, and as he's dying, he makes them promise that they would take his bones back to the, that same cave. And then later on, Joseph, as he's died, even though he was embalmed and buried in Egypt, he made him promise to dig up his bones when, when Yahweh took them out and to take them back and bury them in the place of his ancestors. Raquel told Steve, don't let my bones stay here. When you go back, take them with you. And I thought, what an example of faith. What an example of saying, I want to, I want to go back and be with my people. I have a love for the covenant and for the covenant people that I'm a part of. I don't want to remain in Egypt. I want to go back and be with my people. And I thought, man, if that doesn't say something about who you are and who you know you are, I don't know what does. And I know that when he wants me to return, I want to go. I want to go. Because you know what? I've got a glimpse of what it's like to be part of the covenant people, and I don't want to give it up. There's too much at stake. There's too much at stake. Okay. Any questions, comments? <clears throat> um, I was given a name, Dr. Caroline Leaf. And I was looking at a YouTube recently of her material. She does um, research on the brain and neuroscience. And it's really fascinating because um, what they found in statistics is that it's not necessarily the experiences, the hardships that we go through that hurt us or affect us. It's how we handle those experiences. And so, um, we make grooves in our brain, so to speak, what other, when we are faced with an experience. So we can either choose to go Yahweh's path and choose to see the good in it, or we can choose um, Hasatan's path and see the negative and dwell on the negative. Whatever choice we make in every situation creates a bigger groove in our brain. So I thought that was really fascinating because I think it is really a mindset and how do we change our mindset if we are stuck kind of going one way rather than the other? So I just am finding that really interesting. And I thought, wow, that really seems to tie into what you're saying. You know, and choose life. Amen. So I guess he knew about all that neural brain thing way back then, didn't he? You know, um, it's really true. Um, there's, a, there, there's, there's a demonic spirit that sometimes gets passed down from generation to generation that actually we can pick up, we can break, but we can also pick it up and begin to perform the sins of our ancestors. How we think is one of them. Do you realize that, that um, still to this day, 
that there's things that come to mind. Now, the choice is, is whether I'm going to carry them out, but there's things to come, that come to mind that were from my family and how we lived. And you know what I've learned, and, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, so don't go there, but I've learned to slow down a little bit in my thinking and to think that out. Is this really what I want to do? Is this really good? Or was this a thing that became a religion for us? Because that's really what happens is we begin to worship those, the way that our parents and our grandparents and whoever did things. You know what? That's what he was saying is that, 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 he, that he will remember the sins uh, of, the, of the, the generations for how many generations? Yeah, because it's passed down. And we just think that, it, that it's become tradition in our families when it's really a spirit that is causing us to be sedentary in it and not make changes. Because you know what? It seems familiar. It seems okay. Doesn't it? It seems okay. Steve talked about this earlier, and it was, it was so good that we need to confront those areas. We need to, to measure them against Yahweh's word. Is this really okay? Because it's only as we measure it against the word and begin to make changes in our life, number one, to repent. You know, we find, we find all of the, the leaders as they... As they um, as they begin to, to take leadership, we find them repenting for the sins of their fathers. That's, that's one of the steps we repent for ourselves and also the sins of our fathers. That's one of the things that needs to take place at very first to begin to move on and change our lives. Is we need to recognize that some of the things that were passed down for, to us were not just traditions, they were sinful. They were against the knowledge of Yahweh. And that's what 2 Corinthians, that, excuse me, uh, yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about, is, is, is taking down the strongholds, and it even identifies that those strongholds are every thought that sets itself up against the knowledge of Yahweh. Only as we, we enter through that and begin to repent of not only our sins, but the sins of our fathers, can those grooves begin to be healed. And new grooves and correct grooves be replaced, be put in its place. I'm telling you people, the more I study this stuff, the more I realize how real this stuff is and how either, how detrimental some of the stuff that we've practiced can be, not only to us, but to the generation to come. I wish, I don't even know all the sins of my fathers. Do you know that? There's stuff in my family that nobody talked about, and I don't know what they are. Huh? Yeah. I have no idea what they are. But they stop talking whenever us kids enter the room. That's all I knew, right? Now, that's an issue. You know, there's a guy, there's, there's a Christian singer, his name, how many remember a guy named Carmen? And he talked, he talked in one of his songs about the idea about coming out of the closet instead of cleaning the closet. You know, there's too many dead bones in those closets that when you come out, it's going to spill out everywhere. 
And he really, he's right. We need to clean the closet. We need to, to hold on to the things of Yahweh. And we need to make that about everything that we do. We can't have the old stuff because the old stuff is leaving footholds in our lives for Satan to play in our lives. We need to be asking Yahweh every day, reveal what's still left in my life that I need to remove. And when he reveals it, take care of it then. That's hard, right? It's part of the birth pain. It's part of the pains that we feel. And that's what he's saying. He says, in a little while, I'll come again. But while you're do- going through this, clean your closet. Make sure that when I return, that, it's, that your love is about your love for me and not for all the other stuff. Do you realize that we th- sometimes think that, that when we don't talk about it that we're doing the right thing? That when we don't take care of the sin that we're doing the right thing? Heaven forbid we offend anybody. This idea of political correctness, I believe is another word for for hushing people up. Yeah. And we had a lot of that going on. Denying the truth. Denying like it didn't happen. We do that when we start denying that it didn't happen. You know what we do? We actually keep that a secret and keep that embedded in our lives and keep Hasatan working in our lives. We don't realize that. But that's, <laughs> I don't know who said it. It said, said when he, it was a friend of mine somewhere, I don't remember who it was, but he said every time he would find something in his closet, he'd go, there's another time we're on the mountain. <laughs> you know, yes, I'm going again. So, but the point is, is that we need to clean it. We need to to get rid of it. We need to face it then. Man, it's hard. How many are firstborns? How hard is it for you? Firstborn, you know, I don't know about you, but when I took a personality test in, in seminary, and of course this was after military, so when I took that personality test in seminary, they pulled me aside and said, you were like the top of the top of a personality. And you need to get rid of some of that. Yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm, I, was, I never used to be as mild as I am now. <clears throat> I have a military ID card that I kept. I was supposed to turn it in, but I kept it. Oops. That you could look at my face and tell that I'm not the same person. And I'm still cleaning. But you know what? We need to get it cleaned. And you know what? When we do get it cleaned, you know what's going to happen? It's going to bust forth. You won't be able to contain the joy that you have. And if you're sitting next to that person, it's going to be all over you as well. So brace yourself. 
Okay, anybody else? I, you got me preaching again. So. Anyone else? <laughs> you you're going to get me started again? No, no. I'm just going to piggyback on that um, because sometimes it's hard for us who are tangible, like, okay, so we need to do something to change, but where's the 10 steps, right? At least that's how I am. So um, Dr. Leaf is a Christian woman, and she has a, if you go onto her website, she's got a 21-day program because we all know it takes at least 21 days to change habits, right? And so, and that's, that's her beginning, but I think you keep continue on with it, and it's something like seven to ten minutes a day, so it's not long, and she gives you steps and all of that and verses and all of that to progress and to change those patterns, if anybody wants to look her up. One over here. Tying that all together, um, um, I was thinking if we confess to one another, he's just and faithful to forgive us. So we get freedom from this. And we also get deliverance a lot of times from generational sins that sometimes we don't even know because it is stuffed. And um, I also believe that's a way you can eliminate gossip. And that's something God just absolutely hates. And if we shared with one another and was transparentable, we could wipe out gossip if we really wanted to. So Hostan is, is greatly with that. So the antidote is be transparentable. Anyone else? Going through a spiritual warfare class and having uh, received information from Aaron Potter, I have never uh, been able to overcome so much stuff that had um, created bondage in my life, generational bondage that was uh, eliminated because of the word. And the misconception that, that I had as a believer that I could be under demonic impression because of generational bondage, as well as footholds that I allowed, that I allowed the strong man to remain. Mm -hmm. And if the strong man is not removed, neither is the sin. We can confess it, and then we go around the mountain again mm -hmm. because we need to eliminate the strong man. For whom the sun sets free is free indeed, the scripture says. And he's talking about binding the strong man, going in there, and re reclaiming the, that territory, that property. You know, the other thing that happens now that he brings this up, it was really hard for me to come to the, the understanding, the full understanding, that I was having trouble with stuff because I liked that sin. Has anybody ever talked to you about that? We all say, oh, I hate sin. Sin all, is all bad and everything. But when it comes right down to it, sometimes in our private life, and I know it's true, but it's been true with me, is that, it, that the reason that sin didn't go away when I repented is because I kind of liked that one. We have pet sins. Do you know that? Oh, this one isn't so bad. Why? Because you're doing it? <laughs> you know? I'd like to say on that note real quickly that uh, when the scripture talks about a familiar sin, I know so often we try to figure out what kind of a sin that is and everything. It's just that. Mm -hmm. It's a familiar, it's a spirit, or a sin that we're familiar with and that, that we like. Mm -hmm. It's hard to overcome. It feels comfortable. And sometimes we even call it a blessing. <laughs> To just to comment on uh, the gentleman's comment, I, I used this illustration one time because it was really gross. So sin to the father is, is repulsive. And so the illustration was this glass of water, and the sin was the sewer. 
And so just one little drop of the sewer, it's okay in the water because it's just a little bit. But then when you think of yourself ingesting that water, you don't want any part of it. And that's, that's how set apart that sin needs to be from us, that we don't want any of it. And then you think to yourself, well, it's not just one drop, it's nine drops. And boy, that glass gets a little bit darker, doesn't it? And it's not really something that you want when you can look at it in that manner. You know, in James, and, and that's what you brought up, is James says that all good things come from the Father of lights, right? So that means when we call something like sin good, we're saying that sin came from the Father. And, you know, when you, when you try to, to think that out, that's not so good. <laughs> it's not even true, you know what I mean? And so that's a good, good place to know that you're not living the truth, is when you're saying that, that something that is evil is from the one that gives good things. Okay, how about if you stand up for the blessing? Do we, um, are we, do we have someone to bring in the Braca stuff? Okay. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, he said, tell Aaron and his sons how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, may Yahweh bless you and protect you. May Yahweh make his, his fate to shine on you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh look with favor on you and give you shalom. In this way, they will pronounce my name over the Israelites and I will bless them. Yivarechecha Yahweh V'yishmarecha Yahweh Yahweh P'anav elecha V'yikunecha Yes, I Yahweh, Pana Veleka, Vehasem Leka, Leka, Shalom. Bring us back to you, Yahweh, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you want to have a seat, well, when they bring the, the Bracca stuff in.